The talk I'm going to do today is uh, called uh, Plugin Development Tips and Tricks. My name is uh, Chris Anisik. Uh, I'm currently known uh, as the PD technical lead over at Eclipse. I work for a small startup uh, known as uh, Code9. I'm a principal consultant over there. And uh, before I actually get started with you guys, how many here actually uh, develop plugins or have developed plugins? A show of hands. So that's a decent amount. OK, so uh, you know, the beginning of this talk is going to sort of uh, basically give you a little brief overview of what PD is and sort of general plugin development things. And then I'm going to sort of jump into these uh, uh, various tips and tricks that you know, I find useful. You know, I've been working on PD for quite a while now in Eclipse, and I have all these little things that I have learned you know, along the way that you know, help me in my daily, uh, daily job. So uh, you know, uh, I'm very informal when I talk, so if you kind of see something that doesn't make sense to you, feel free to stop me and uh, ask a question. Just raise your hand, and uh, I'll stop myself and uh, get to your question. So if that's OK with everyone, uh, I'll begin. So uh, here's one of my favorite screenshots you know, that you know, uh, you know, we've uh, came up with over at the PDE team. So basically, this is your uh, shot, uh, screenshot of the Eclipse Workbench. And then you see within Workbench, all the little different colored uh, pieces all come from different uh, various components within Eclipse. So you see you, know, you got the Workbench. You have User Assistance that provides the help. You have the perspectives. You have all these uh, various little things that come together. And you know, all these things are seamlessly integrated, integrated together. And you know, they're all plugins, right? You know, everything is a plugin that you see uh, on the Eclipse Workbench. So uh, what is PDE? What, you know, what, do I, uh, what do I work on? Uh, it's the plugin development environment. So basically, anything that you use to develop plugins is something that uh, is from PDE. So you know, we have wizards to create and export, import export plugins. We got templates for new plugins. A lot of you who ever actually contributed something to Eclipse, you probably used those fancy little new templates we have for like adding a new view or you know, adding a little command. So that's all part of uh, PDE. We have internationalization tools. So anything that you do within Eclipse uh, regarding plugins is something that uh, is provided by the PDE uh, team. So you know, just like everything else in Eclipse, PDE is implemented as a set of uh, plugins built on top of the Java development tools. Uh, you know, we're seamlessly integrated into Eclipse. And you know, just like everything else in Eclipse, we don't get any special uh, treatment from you know, the JDT or uh, the, you know, the platform uh, in terms of how we integrate. So you know, like, like I said, it's plugins all the way down. You know, to basically build on top of Eclipse, you've got to write a plugin. To extend Eclipse, you've got to write a plugin. To write a rich client, you have to write, you know, rich client application, you have to write a plugin. To write an OSGI based application, you have to write a plugin. So this talk is all about uh, basically uh, little tips and tricks that you could use uh, uh, basically uh, on your own plugin writing adventures. So uh, you know, the first one uh, I have here is uh, target management. How many, how many of you are familiar with uh, the concept of a target platform in, in Eclipse? So, Okay, that's a decent amount. So basically, to what, how, how I explain this is when you launch Eclipse and you start creating plugins, uh, PD by, by, its, by default points to your running instance as the target platform. So when you create a new plugin project, you are basically developing against you know, what you're currently running against. What it, what's common for people to do is you know, uh, they'll download uh, the latest Eclipse. They'll get like three, four, maybe Ganymede you know, you know, tomorrow when, when it officially comes out. And uh, say they're developing uh, a product that maybe runs on Eclipse 3.3. So you could use the latest Eclipse, and you could point to you know, another you know, target platform maybe being your product based on 3.3 and have everything you know, magically work, you know, able to self-host and all that good stuff. So you know, the target platform uh, feature in uh, Eclipse allows you to do that. So um, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. Most people don't realize that you could actually develop against older versions of, uh, of Eclipse using, uh, using your target platform. So there's another good one uh, in, in Eclipse called the Plugins View. So, uh, if we go to the plugins view, let me show an example here. Let's see here. So we have the plugins view in Eclipse. A, a common use case for people is uh, a lot of people that do Java development in Eclipse uh, probably use the shortcut uh, Control Shift T. You know, is that familiar for people? You, I guess it's uh, Apple Shift T. You pop up and you got like a bunch of classes you could uh, you could browse to. So in the plugins view, besides just listing you know the plugins that you have available for you to work with, there's a neat little thing where you could basically uh, let's find a, a class that I'm uh, familiar. Let's add all the help all the help ones. So you could right click these, and there's an option called Add to Java Search. So you know, what that does is basically uh, PD adds these plugins to the Java Search. So now when you search for like I help something, you know, I help shows up in your, uh, in, in your search now, which uh, you know, would, did not show up before. So it's just a neat little way to uh, basically uh, 
have uh, these classes available for your search. So what's common for, so what, so what some people do, which I don't recommend depending on performance, is they'll basically select everything in that view and add it to Java search. So it's just a nice little way to jump to things based on what you have in your, uh, in your, target, uh, in your target platform. We don't, you know, people have complained to us that we should sort of do this by default, but uh, you know, in the interest of performance, we, we don't do this. Yes, do you have a question there? Yeah, I've, I've noticed that for some, for some tool frameworks, you need to actually unzip the source jars to be able to see the things. Is this, you know, if I were doing this, would I not need to do that? So if, if, if you, so there needs to be source associated with, with these somehow. And there's a couple ways of doing that uh, in PDE. There's that source extension point, or it could actually be bundled with the jar, or there's a new way uh, using a special Eclipse source bundle header now. But the source has to be, PDE has to be aware somehow of how to get to the source, so. Yeah, this was a case where the source is there, but it's all jarred up, and I actually need to expand them for any of my searches into that plugin sources to work. That's interesting. So I was wondering if this was a way around that. Uh, it, it, should, it should work. So I, I'd have to see. I'd, you know, after the talk, we could, we could look at it to see if that, that solves, your, solves your problem. So OK, so that's, that's the plugins view. You know, some people find it useful. But uh, you know, like, like I said, you know, adding things to Java search is, is quite useful if you're quickly using Apple Shift T or Control Shift T to jump to uh, uh, various classes. Let's see. What, what, what else do we have next on the, on the, on the plugin tip list? Ah, the error log. So uh, you know, your classic error log view. In a 3.3, it was very plain. But uh, in 3.4, uh, which will be out tomorrow, we, we've added quite, uh, quite a few cool things. So let me, let me demonstrate for you, because the best way to do it is to actually show you. So now, let's see, let's see if we make it a little bigger. So we added some filtering, so you could actually search you know, for, for log entries if, if, if you wanted to, right? But um, other things we have done is uh, there, you could group now, so you could group uh, by session. So a common thing for people to do when they develop plugins is to self-host a lot, right? You know, you'll, 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 you'll make a change in your plugin, you launch to test, and you keep, you know, keep going through that iterative process. So you could group by session, and you could see basically you know, which, uh, you know, the various sessions where they are, what, what happens. So you know, that's uh, kind of uh, useful in that regard. You could also group your um, entries by, doo -doo -doo, by plugin. So you got to see where, where they come to. So if you're only interested in a specific set of plugins, you could uh, easily browse that. Uh, another cool thing that we did is uh, if you use Eclipse, you're familiar with probably the concept of launch configurations and stuff like that. So uh, you know you typically self-host by uh, creating a launch configuration and, and, and launching it. So the log view is now aware of uh, the various launch configurations you have and also uh, uh, what, what you have launched and the logs associated with it. So for example. I have a uh, launch configuration, just a typical workbench, which pretty much just launches you know, all the plugins enabled that you have in your workspace and your target. And the log view here is aware of that. And you could jump to that log immediately associated with that, you know, uh, with that launch configuration. So you can see a bunch of stuff. So this is, this is basically, you could see the location here where that bad boy uh, actually is. So this is quite useful if you're dealing with a lot of uh, uh, different uh, launch configurations and you uh, need to be able to quickly get to them. You could also jump back to the workspace, you know, back to the home place too. So if you if you need to, so just a little, uh, you know, the log view got a little love during the three four release. So it's just a good thing to know about some little things that could help you through your journey. Now moving on to oops, sure. So what you said in there is rather than having to look at the error log of the Eclipse that I launched from there, yes, the Eclipse from where I launched can actually give me the error log. Yep. Yeah, so by default, you see that it launches, you know, here's a launch location, right? And if I actually jump in there, see if this works. Oh, it works. Can you repeat the question? Oh, can I? So basically, uh, I believe you, uh, the, uh, whatever your name is, you were asking, um, basically, this feature now allows you to, uh, instead of browsing through the log manually, like I'm doing here, with, with, the, with the runtime configuration, you know, you go, you, well, you basically have to jump to the, the, uh, workspace location and dig and find the logs. Instead of doing that, you are now able to just do this simply via the log view. So you can just go to that launch configuration and it'll jump to the log that's located located there. So that's basically what the, the brunt of his, uh, his question was doing. So yep, you could, that does it for all your, all, your, all your various launch configurations. All right, let's see what else we got here. Ah, execution environments. Uh, how many people are familiar with uh, execution environments at all? Probably not many. It's an OSGI-centric thing. But basically, when you build plugins, right, you know, uh, you're usually building them to target something, some type of environment. Well, execution environments are basically a way to say that you know, 
your plugin is only meant to run on maybe Java 1.4 or maybe you know maybe Java 5.0. It's using fancy generics, so it, you know it's it, you know its minimum is that. And you know this is what's cool about this is that the the OSGI runtime or you know within Eclipse will actually enforce this. So for example, say you're uh, you, you know, your product needs to run on 1.4. So you're building a bunch of 1.4 plugins, but you also want to use some 5.0 stuff, so you build some 5.0 related things. So in case maybe your customer actually runs on 5.0, they'll be able to use these things. So what the runtime will do is, you know, if when it launches, it knows all its plugins, it knows all the ex execution environments associated with those plugins. If you're using, uh, you know, 1.4, it's not going to load your, you know, plugins that specify an execution environment of uh, as as 5.0. So it's it's quite neat uh, in that order. Also, when you're actually going to build your plugins, it actually sets up uh, the proper compiler settings and stuff like that to make sure. Uh, it, get, it gets built properly. You know, if you're using 1.4, you know, here, here are the magical settings you need to do for 1.4, and same with uh, 5.0. So it's, uh, it, it's quite an interesting thing. It's, it's not, it wasn't used that much in the past because there wasn't really good tooling for it in PDE, but in 3.4 now, you'll notice that when you go create a new, um, a new plugin project, you will see that, uh, whoop, let's, let's cheat, uh, plugin, a new plugin project. You'll notice that pretty much uh, you're giving you're given an option immediately now to specify an execution environment. So we're trying to get people to uh, adopt this best practice uh, in terms of specifying these. And you'll notice if you have old plugin projects that you import into 3.4, PDE will actually flag them with a warning, say that oh you guys should you should set something. This is a good thing to do. So uh, keep that in mind when you're uh, developing plugins. Sure. Question. Sure. So we've got a situation where the plugins we're developing need to be built. On Five, you know, the target system that they're running in mm -hmm. needs to be and of course that. So you need so in other words, you know, I'm building plugins to help develop code, right? Yeah, sure. But so they could run so they could so run so they could need one five for the plugin to run. So Eclipse has to be running under one five. But the target code could be one four. No, it has to be one four okay. because of some stupid level. Okay, but can you <laughs> So is it is, so is it okay for you to run on on a uh, on one five too? I mean, it should be all gravy, right? You can run on one five, but you've got to develop. There's a there's one build step that needs to be on okay. one four two compiler, so you really need to have your development environment set up to one four two. But once you've built your class files, then it can all execute. It's only this one. It's four of a loaded Java procedures. So if you need to, uh, so that yes, yeah, so that. Two's aren't going to it, but the the thrust of the, the question is. I need to run my plugin on one five. Yep. But the, I want to set it so that the target configuration is one four two when I'm running my plugin doing the job file. So if you set your Brie as we as we call it, the execution environment. You could set it one four. That implies so it's going to set up your compiler settings to be all one four gravy. You know, you know the one four gravy train. So I'm developing my plugin, or as I'm when, when you're building, when you're going to build. So, what's up? I can't build them on one So then what you would do is you would specify, uh, so you could specify both, right? So if you specify, um, so we actually do this. So you could specify, uh, we do this with the, uh, the, found, the foundation type, you know, you're familiar with foundation. So basically uh, certain things we, we need to compile against 1.4, but it, we could run on foundation 1.1. So you specify 1.4 and foundation. Uh, you could specify multiple breeze here. So in your case, you would have an odd case where you'd specify one five first, and then one f and another one four Bree. So basically, when you go to build and compile, it'll use one five. But you're saying you could also run on one four, which is which is quite weird. I don't know how you exactly do that, but we could we could talk about that uh, offline. So, but basically, when you go to build when you go to when you go to build, it uses the first entry in this list to set up the the proper settings. Sure. We'll we'll talk afterwards. So I mean, it's it's a little too too much for the audience, maybe. Okay, so now we, we have execution environments done. Let's let's look at something else. So uh, uh, OSGI launch configure. How many how many in the room are familiar with the OSGI? Is is that is that like a hot hot term for people? Yeah. yeah so that's good. Uh, so PDE by default, you know, PDE for a long time has supported plugins. You know, Eclipse has had the concept of plugin for a long time. In a 3.0 time frame, we actually chose to adopt you know OSGI as sort of the plugin uh, modularity layer. PDE provides good tooling, just like you know you uh, use the Eclipse application launch configuration. We have an OSGI uh, launch configuration where you could specifically uh, uh, tinker with uh, various OSGI environments. By default, of course, we work with the uh, OSGI framework that ships with Eclipse, which is Equinox. But you're able to plug in your own uh, if you wish. And there's some more advanced settings for people to uh, to to toy with. 
How many, how many of you remember Quake back in the day? Lots of Quake people in here? Yeah, Disney Smell. Remember that Quake console you, you had? You know, you, you set up God mode, it was like IDD, QD, or whatever. So um, uh, Eclipse has a similar concept. We, we, have a, we have an OSGI console, so it kind of gives you that same power. There may not be a, like a God mode, but, um, but you still have. <laughs> you can shoot things, yeah. So, so if you launch uh, Eclipse with, uh, let's let's find a little example here. Let's find my little hello. Let's see here. Uh, bu -bu -bum. Let's put a dash console here. So if you launch with uh, dash console, boop, you go to the console view. You got this little OSCI prompt, you know. So if if you type help, you'll get a bunch of commands. But there's a you know tons of commands around status. Uh, you know, SS, like short status, you'll basically see the status of sort of all the bundles, um, you know, uh, available, you know, to you uh, within the runtime. You could do things like, you know, let's see, uh, org eclipse.high hasn't started, so doo -doo -doo. you could start org eclipse.high, you know, it starts, you could stop it, you know, all these cool little things you could do within the console. You could diagnose bundles, so if you're, you know, if your bundle is having a problem, you could diagnose it with, you know, diag, and it's, just uh, a cute little thing to use sometimes to um, basically help debug certain scenarios. You could also uh, pass basically, um, here's another sneaky, not really a secure way of doing things, but if you launched a console and you put, I believe, a, let's see, what's a magical, four, five, six, seven. Oh, it's already running, so I can't do that. Let's do that again. So you could actually put a port number after that and it'll launch the workbench, and you, you, you listen here, and you'll get a little console. Oh, I'm such a Mac, Mac noob still. Um, what was it, four, five, six, seven? Maybe not. Well, the, the, yeah, so here we go. I'm now working in, you know, a tell net. It's sort of a cheap way to do uh, <laughs> remote uh, sort of administration or, you know, diagnosis in case, you know, maybe you're, uh, environment is on some server and you just launch it to, to debug with. So it's just a different uh, way to, uh, to work with things. So what's cool about this console also is you could also provide custom commands, right? So, uh, you know, if the, I, I linked an article up there um, which you could go to and it'll show you basically how to sort of contribute your own uh, command uh, to the console. Uh, when, when I was chilling uh, out, outside, um, uh, outside this room, I wrote like a quick little example that contributed a, a little command. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with sort of like the uname type thing. Uname is a very common uh, Unix type thing. So, you know, I just created this little command. So if I go back to my console, my plugin will start, you type uname, you know, oh, I'm running on a Mac. So, so you could also provide custom commands here, you know, for your own application, you know, in case you need to do some uh, debugging of, of some type or have some hooks into your application that you may not, uh, you know, have available to you. So it's just a nice little way uh, way to do that. So there's a good article I linked that I wrote a while ago that shows you how to do that with uh, some some nice uh, some nice examples. So there's the uh, sure. Do you happen to know anybody who's built test drivers? Te so testing OSGI console commands. OSGI bundles via the OSGI console. So yeah, that's possible. Like the the. So he's basically asking, uh, has someone created some type of test driver to, you know, basically to test OSGI bundles? And, uh, well, you know, I mean, you're probably asking for more than what is provided by sort of PD and, and, a, and a test framework, right? Because, you know, we could launch, you know, JUnit plugin tests and you could test your series of plugins. You could also run this headless if you want to. Even the OSGI TCK uh, comes up with a way to sort of remotely do this where they'll deploy bundles and they'll run them and test them. So I don't think there's anything uh, out there that you know is you could probably easily grab besides what uh, ships with 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 Eclipse. So, but we could chat uh, offline uh, about this issue if you're if you're interested in it. All right, where was I? Oop, no more quick. Um, so there's the display. So this is less a plugin development tip, more of a normal Java development tip because it's also usable uh, uh, usable in the in the Java context. So uh, how many how many people are familiar with the display view? at all? Not many? Okay, so this is actually something that needs to be shown live. So I have a, here we go, I have my little bundle activator here. I have a breakpoint, so people are probably familiar with the concept of breakpoints. Breakpoints are good, allows you to sort of basically go somewhere in your code and, and stop. So let me, let me launch this bad boy. 
And so, you know, it's in the debug mode asking me to, uh, you know, basically go to a breakpoint. Oh, I have another breakpoint here. So I got one here. So let's see here. Let's let's do another way. Let's continue on. Okay, this is the one I want to go to. So we have this breakpoint here, and we see that it's you know you know creating various things. So if you go actually to the display view, if you open up that that guy here, you actually have access to sort of uh, should have code completion. Yeah. So so basically what you're doing is based on where you have stopped in your breakpoint, you're able to do certain things, right? So you could call you know, this method, or actually, how about this? Let's do this. System not out, the print line, hello. So you could basically execute a line of code in, in, the, in, this, in this context and, you know, get a value. So basically allows you to sort of stop and maybe toy with certain things that you have. It's, it's, it's quite nice. So this is sort of a, I use this probably like on a, on a daily basis to like debug various uh, aspects of code, you know, stop at a breakpoint and just, chill for a while and see, you know, oh, me call this method, see what happens. So it's, it's, it's quite nice. And you get code completion uh, in this view. This is one of sort of the hidden gems in Eclipse that most people just don't know about because it's probably not really widely, widely pub publicized. So the other tip that kind of goes with this one. See, oh, sure, sure. Man in the back. <laughs> the display, the thing that bugs me the most is that you actually have to select the thing to evaluate. It doesn't have to do like by a line if I want. It's kind of clunky to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so his question was, you know, it's, it's kind of clunky the way I'm executing, uh, whoop, the way I'm executing this is that I have to actually select it and then basically uh, hit execute for it to do something. So uh, if, if you have a sort of a better, you know, way to do this, you know, Eclipse is an open source community and, you know, we love patches. So if you have like sort of, you know, a better way to do it, feel free to contribute it back. I, I would be glad to see it because, you know, it is, is kind of annoying that you, have, that you have to do that. But. So back to, back to this one. So conditional breakpoints. Do people know about conditional breakpoints? They're like my favorite thing in the world. Yeah, this, this, guy, this guy knows about, yeah, yeah. Robert knows about conditional breakpoints. So now that we kind of understand this breakpoint concept, right, imagine if we actually you know, write a little Java code to actually basically say that you know, I want to stop here based on certain conditions. Maybe you're entering uh, a method with like a, as like a parameter called string ID. Right, you enter it ID and say, you know, that method is called by like a million people, right? You know, it would be nice to maybe set up a little breakpoint that says, you know, if ID equals maybe whatever I wanted to and have it just stop there instead of hitting do, 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 you're just going to keep iterating until, until you get through. So we actually have a concept of, of we, actually, we actually can do this in, in Eclipse. Yes, this, this guy, what's? The other thing is like conditional breakpoints based on some other breakpoint having been hit before. Okay. So I'll go back to the whole question of we're welcome to contri contribute, <laughs> contribute anything you want. But um, so, so the good example I have on this one, so I set one up before I, I, for my presentation here. So since, since I'm pretty snazzy and, and, and sort of know, you know the internals of you know, the you know, Equinox framework and, and stuff like that, there is one particular method here in, in it's called bundle loader, load class. So basically, every class that is loaded by OSGI, or Equinox in this case, is going to go through this method. And so if you're trying to debug, like, you know, for example, you have some class and you get some weird class loading you know, issue, right? If you imagine iterating through like the bazillion classes that happen when you load an Eclipse Workbench, it's going to take you an eternity, right? You know, you'll, you'll age really quickly. So what I've done here is I've set a breakpoint. Just like you, know, you normally set a breakpoint, you want to you target it there, then there's this fancy Breakpoint properties here, right? Oh, enable condition, right? This sounds good, right? So I'm going to do that, and then I look at this method. So I got I got name as obviously here. So I want you know name, you know equals you know you know you know com that Google dot you know my class, right? So you would do that, and then get OK, and then you notice you get that little question mark, which implies a conditional breakpoint. So now when you go to launch. It's actually going to test uh, that breakpoint for that condition, so it will actually stop and uh, uh, stop when it you know it satisfies the condition. It's quite nice. I mean, I, this, I use this quite frequently, so I highly recommend it. If you know you ever had that uh, moment where you're sitting debugging code and you're like, you know, crap, I got to iterate through you know however however many times I need to to get to what I'm really interested in. So it's uh, it's quite useful. So this this little uh, this is one I like. If I if I have like 
top, top 10 break points in Eclipse, this one is like, like number two or something like that. Because if you're ever fighting, I, I guess for me, more so since I do more of the low-level internal type stuff, but if you're ever fighting like class loading issues, you start there. And then you just see what's going on. So it's just, just a little tip for you guys if you ever go, go, go to that, uh, that aspect. All right, now that we're done with conditional breakpoints, what else do we got? Ah, plugin dependencies use. So, wow, so I remember looking at the uh, eBay presentation uh, that, that went on, and, and there was like, pff, I don't know how many you know, projects in their workspace. So you, you have the sort of same problem when uh, you're developing plugins, right? Because you could have maybe like, you know, maybe you have a really big product and you got like 100 plugins in your workspace. Sort of visualizing those dependencies is quite difficult. So in PDE, we actually have a plugin dependencies view. So let me show you this uh, live in action here. So if I go to plugin dependencies, I have this nice little view. Uh, let's turn this turn this off. So let's focus on uh, one of the let's focus on my PD plugin, PD core. Right? Actually, no, let's yeah, no. yeah, let's do PD UI. Let's do that one. So you look at PD UI, and we have this concept of uh, show uh, you know callees and callers. So right now you could directly see in this view what PD UI is depending on. So if you look at the if you actually look at the manifest.mf inside a plugin, you could see you know you list all your dependencies. This is sort of just a visualization uh, of that. So you could just go through and drill down and see oh you know these are all the guys that are depending. Uh, these are all the these are all the plugins that PD UI is depending on. You could also flip this around, and you can actually see. You know uh, who is uh, depending on uh, you know who needs PDUI. So you flip around and you see ah, you know these are the guys that are actually depending on uh, you know use PDUI in, in some way. So you sort of get the the reverse uh, perspective here. What's also cool is you know some some people like pictures, right? You know pictures are like a thousand words for people. I guess that's the old saying. So we have another way to visualize plugins. So if you uh, we have this project in the uh, PD incubator called uh, I guess the graph. Plugin dependencies view, so which gives you sort of visualization of, of things. So, if we launch this guy, graph plugin dependencies. Oop, you guys, see that okay? So we could focus on um, let's focus on PD core here, and boop, you get this nice little picture here that that kind of shows you, uh, you know, what's what's going on. You could see the various dependencies uh, um, all highlighted. Uh, what's also cool about this, you could also see, so for example, you're looking at all these crazy dependencies and you're like, all right, so these are my direct kind of dependencies, but you're also like, you're also dragging in update core. You're like, why do I need update core? So you could do a dependency path and you click update core and then you can see, ah, it's this, this, this guy that's dragging in that, in that beast for me. So, you know, it would be nice to get rid of him, but you can't, He's, he just stays with you. But, um, <laughs> But, uh, and you could also do things like uh, take a screenshot and you know, all that good stuff. So, oh, here's a little preview. So it's quite nice you know, if you're trying to just sort of visualize maybe your, even your architecture of your application. You know, it's a good way to sort of do this. And so this code right now just is in the incubator. We haven't been able to uh, uh, bring it in the SDK yet, but you know, it's one of my dreams to actually do this because you know, people find this visualization very useful. Uh, yes, do you have a question? Are you saying that I have to also use or enable people to use it for the Java class path? Uh, so right now, this strictly works on the PDE class path, class path container. So if someone wants to write some visualization that worked on something else, uh, you know, they could. I mean, right now, this this actually is not too much code. Surprisingly, it uses a uh, lightweight um, drawing framework called Zest. It's actually used to be part of the Mylan project, but now it's part of uh, the graphical editor framework project, and it's it's great stuff. It allows you to create these. Basically, you know, quick and easy graphical editors with not right, you know, not focusing too much on actually like the graph and UI code. You don't have to worry about like layouts and all these crazy things. You could just work, you know, focus on like giving it a model. So, and you know, here's my model. Here's what I want to do with it. Here's a layout I want, and it'll do all the magic for you. So, uh, it's all good. Yep. Man in the back. How directly coupled is this incubator project to to the to the plugins uh, to, to, to the plugins that plugins? So this specific code that you're looking at right now is part of the PDE incubator, and it is uh, quite tightly coupled to PDE. But the actual visualization you're seeing here, that the stuff that enables you to do this, is not. It's it's off to the side, part of a uh, part of GEF. It's really small. But how much? Uh, I guess what I'm, how, how much additional framework are you putting around it? Besides, besides your dependencies. Dude, it's like it's like I, you know I, I basically in PDE we have this concept of a state, right? You know, here's our state. The state has all the you know plugins, how they're related. Here's the state. 
you know, here, you know, it's like it's sort of like JFace. If you ever use JFace, like, oh, here's my model, here's my input, right? right. Similar concept. It handles all the, you know, graphing and all that stuff for you. It's very cool. It's really, it's really like Zest is one of my favorite projects out there in Eclipse because, like, if you ever done visualization, visualization, visualization is hard. It's it's a hard problem. You gotta worry about, you know, it lines intersecting and all these crazy, you know, layout type things, zooming, all the stuff. So Zest handles all that, all that for you. So we we could chat about it afterwards. I could point you to it. It's good stuff. All right, what, ne what next do we have in the Plugin Developers Toolkit? Ah, Organized Manifest uh, Wizard. So here's a little obscure thing that uh, not many people know about. We have this tucked away. Actually, let me go back to the slide. So we have this guy tucked away in the PDE Tools menu, but basically we have this little cute little wizard that will basically allow you to sort of, uh, we call it like scrubbing your manifest. We got that little scrubber icon up there in the top right for the wizard. But basically it will go through and do certain things in your plugin, right? For example, one thing we do in PDE is, or actually in Eclipse in general, we have this concept of exporting all of our packages, right? You know, basically your plugin, you know, we want all our packages to be seen because we found that our adopters, no matter how much we want to try to hide stuff, they always want to use some crazy internal things. So we have to export everything. This wizard provides you sort of a, a way to do it automatically because it's sometimes common. You know, you're creating a new plug, you have an old plug and you add a new package and oh, you forgot to add it to, you know, the manifest to, to export it. It does other things. It'll actually, you could actually scan and remove unused dependencies. One thing that sometimes happens is you're working on a plugin and you know you decide to add a ton of dependencies to it, right? This could actually scan and try to remove unused uh, dependencies, amongst other things. You know, uh, you know, another common thing is uh, NLS keys. You know, sometimes you're working on translation and you know externalizing strings. Uh, you refactor things around and you leave some strings externalized that you didn't really aren't you really using anymore. This thing will come and come and catch. Uh, catch that issue. So I mean, it's really easy to do. So if you look at, if we go back to the Project Explorer, let's go here. You just right click a plugin. Let's go to this one. This one's a little bit better. You click that. You do Organize Manifest. It's really a bad location, but actually, the other. Whoop, let me open this guy. The other way to get to it is if you go to the Overview page, it should appear in three four. Uh, da -da. Yep, we. It's here. So you could do Organize Manifest. You click it here, and then you could just show. Uh, Basic little things you could do, so you know, mark things internal if you know if they have internal in a namespace type thing, all this good stuff. So, it's there for you to uh, use. It's it's often used by the Eclipse team. You know, before we actually usually commit something, we usually run it through the organized manifest wizard right before a release, just to make sure everything's in tip top, uh, tip top shape. All right, what's next? Uh, product editor. Uh, I mean, if you're, build, if you're building uh, products in Eclipse, you know, if you're building RCP-based applications, PDE provides really good tooling for you to uh, develop uh, uh, the, these things. It provides stuff. Uh, here, you know what? I'm, I'm, big, I'm a big fan of actually just trying to do stuff. So let's see if I could do this live. Live demos are fun. So um, I'll, I'll create a quick little plugin project. Let's call it uh, rcp.mail. We have a fantastic... Um, Example that ships with Eclipse. So if you want to create a rich client application, hit yes. Do, do, do. RCP mail template. Hit finish. Magical. So you do that. And what we could do is, uh, so let's see here. So if we launch this guy, got our splash screen. Oh, we have a little product. So we have our own little custom product application. This is kind of a base template that we ship with. So one thing basically that you know you need to start focusing on when you develop products is, you know, you basically have to specify, you know, uh, common questions are like, you know, sh should I bundle a JRE with this product? How do I brand this thing? All these uh, little things that you need to do. So we have a concept of a product configuration uh, in PDE that helps you control this. So I could create an, uh, let's do it, mail.product based on the existing product I've defined. I click that. And bam, I have this file that basically, you know, allows me to sort of specify all the plugins my product depends on. In this mail application, here's what I need. Uh, I could specify custom config.ini's, which is kind of an advanced concept, but it's useful for some. Uh, for some people, when you go to launching, uh, you could also specify, you know, maybe my product needs, you know, J2SE 1.5, right, you know, or needs, you know, Java 1.4. So you could actually specify, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, a JRE here. And, you know, when you go actually go to build this product, it'll actually include the JRE you know, with, with your product. So it's, a, it's quite useful. Uh, you could specify, you know, you could specify the launcher name. You could maybe, you know, if you're writing Android, you know, maybe you call it android.exe. So it's just a way of s customizing the um, bits and pieces of your product. You could do program arguments, uh, VM arguments, all that good stuff. 
uh, you could customize the splash screen. So for example, if we, um, we want to use a, for example, we want a different uh, splash screen, uh, we could do this. Actually, what's, yeah, let's try this one. So you save that. And when you go to launch, I think we should get a new splash screen. Oh, I broke something. I was probably toying with things, so I probably broke something. Do, do, do. Specify none. That's the bad thing about live demos. Things break sometimes. All right, let's try it again. If not, I'll, I'll just move on. Yeah, so you get this, you get this customizable splash, uh, splash screen, right? So it just, it just saves you a little time when uh, you're developing your, uh, your product. And there's also things with branding. So a common thing is you know, branding a product with various images and you know, welcome screens and stuff like that. So this is just like a one central area where you could all do this. So uh, it's, it's quite nice because what's also good about this is um, if you're familiar with uh, building plugins or building products in Eclipse, build, building, building is, quite, is an art form I like to refer to in Eclipse. It's, it's a difficult task. You could actually drive your build using this file. So you know, when you actually go to build, you point PD build to this file and it'll you know, magically build what you need to based off this file. So it's quite nice in that regard, but, oh, man in the back. Any support to a package of product as an RSC implication over GNLP? Or are you going to tell me that I can contribute this myself? So uh, we don't, in the product file, we don't provide that uh, out of, at like an out of box thing uh, you could do. But when you actually go, I think we have this in the actual product export wizard. Let me. Da, da, da. Let's just let's just call this something. Blah. Oh come on! Stop being. Uh... So I'm pretty sure. Come on! Let's just put this guy somewhere. Slash opt. So if you. No, we don't have it for that. No, so you could do it when you export features and plugins. You could do that, but we don't have support for that. Like sort of in a UI way. But uh, via via like a sort of headless and, and command line, you could you could do it as part of PDE build. It's something PDE build PDE build provides. But we don't we, ha we don't we don't have it exposed in the UI for products. We could talk about it talk about it later. But you could also contribute it back if you wanted to if you want something in the UI there. More than welcome to. Uh, okay. Doing okay here. Um, externalized strings. So you know uh, you know eventually uh, you know you could try to develop everything in English, but uh, You'll be surprised. There's someone else who wants to use it in you know some different uh, different locale. So uh, we have an easy wizard in PD called the Externalized String Wizards, which uh, enables you to externalize things really easily. So you know over here I have my little mail product. So I could quickly uh, go PD Tools. I could do uh, Externalized Strings, and I get this awesome little wizard that will basically show me um, all the little you know basically externalize everything it finds for me manually, so you don't have to do this by hand. It's quite nice. It's kind of like the Java, the Java tools provide this type of thing. So it's quite nice. Sets it up all for you. Don't, you don't have to worry about it. Don't have to think about this. Just, just make sure to do it every so often when, when you're developing. So what other cool stuff do we got here? Ah, so when, when people, when, develop a, when they develop plugins, you're probably familiar with versions, right? You know, the way in Eclipse, you have a major, minor, and a micro uh, version. So you, you know, for 3.4, we have 3.4.0. Well, there's, there's another dot you could put. You could put 34.0.qualifier. That dot qualifier is something that, uh, by default, when uh, you go to build or export your plugin, uh, it's set, it's set at, at, you know, for today's date or whatever time, like timestamp. It just gets a timestamp. But you could actually customize this to be whatever value you need, depending on whatever uh, requirements you have for your product. So it's common for, uh, for people to, uh, to use this. And we also, in, 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 the feed, in, in the export wizard, you could also set it to be whatever you want to, because uh, we have common cases where, you know, for example, you have a lockdown product and you want to be kind of, you know, you don't want to like reinstall your plugin. You kind of, you kind of could be naughty and like set it to be whatever the date was in that product, export and then like drop it in and restart. And you know, it's just a little way, a way to sort of uh, do things. But uh, I highly recommend always uh, specifying the, the doc qualifier. It's harmless. Uh, we also have the plugin registry view, which is really cool. So um, remember that console I showed you? Well, you could kind of view this as almost a, uh, a visual representation into the console. So this basically shows you everything that's currently running uh, in, in your uh, current uh, application here. So we see that you know, a couple plugins are all launched and, and good to go. You could do, um, 
you know, you could show uh, extension points only, so you could quickly browse various extensions and see cool things like that. But the cool little thing that we added uh, recently in 3.4 was uh, this little show advanced operations thing. You click that, oh, and now we could be really naughty and we could start like, you know, you know, starting things, and I don't want to stop that, that's bad. Um, so you can start and stop things all from uh, this visual, uh, visual thing. And you're, able, you're also able to diagnose plugins, you know, if there's a problem with it, you don't know why, you know, you'll get a nice little informative pop-up of, uh, of what's going on. So it's that. Oh yeah, I didn't show the cool thing. You could also use this to like, you know, for example, you're looking for like an I, like maybe, maybe something like the log view. You could type like log view maybe. Yeah, and you could see like various, you, it just quickly shows you all the extensions and all the good stuff that's contributed by various people. It's quite nice. All right, in the interest of time. So another common thing for people to do is, um, you know, you're developing plugins and all of a sudden you have like some third party dependencies. Maybe you have like Hibernate or you have something else out there that you need to drag in, some like commons, net commons, whatever. So we have a nice little wizard called a plugin project from existing jars. So what you do is you launch this wizard, you point to the jars you want, and when you hit finish, I'll generate you a new plugin project with all those you know, uh, jars embedded into it and all the classes there available for reuse. So this is you know, a nice way to sort of uh, bundle any, any external dependencies that you have that may not be plugins already. So this allows you to convert uh, external dependencies uh, into, uh, into a nice plugin. Yes, Mr. Rob. Can you talk about <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, I've been trying to do something similar. Yep. Uh, but I needed it to run automatically as part of another task. So part of another operation. Okay. Uh, I, Is it because you want to generate your own? It, if I recall correctly, when I was looking at what you were saying, yeah, well, yeah, that, that code is in, in itself is quite tight, uh, tightly coupled to, to the UI. But what's your, we could talk about offline because there's other tools to sort of do that. There's right. some called BND that okay. does something similar, but we could, talk, uh, okay. we could talk about that later. I think I'm breezing through here. Okay, let's talk about some of the, new, the, like the newer stuff in, in 3.4. So here's, uh, here's something called, uh, I call Plugin Spy. So, you know, let's, let's show you the, the normal example I like to show. So a common thing for me in Eclipse was, you know, when I started developing is, you know, I see some cool code out there, you know, I see like the, the error, you know, the common case for me is, you know, I was developing an RCP application, I see the error log view, and I was like, I want that in my application, right? You know, how do I get that? Or, you know, or how do they do this, you know, with code? So the plugin spy and sort of the, uh, sort of the way like Firebug works, if you ever use Fire, you know, Firefox or did some like web app development, kind of does a similar thing to Eclipse. You're able to introspect the workbench. So basically I have the log view selected, and if I hit Alt Shift F1, you get a little pop-up called the Plugin Spy, and what it shows you is that the view that you're looking at, you know, is the error log view. You know, the class that implements it is log view, so you could, you know, immediately jump to that class if you wanted to. You know, it comes from this plugin. Here's the identifier that the views use. Here's any like help context IDs associated with it. So within like a click, you're able, you know, to jump to the source for what you're looking at, right? You could even get fancier, and like, you know, for example, say you wanted to contribute to the menu of, you know, of like the plugin dependencies here. You hit it here, and, uh, oh, I did the wrong shortcut. You hit it here, and, you know, now you see that, you know, the active view is a package explorer part, and, you know, here's, you know, the, act, the active selection here is a class path container. So you're able to sort of uh, introspect what's going on in the workbench and able to quickly see uh, what you may be interested in. So. It's just a common, this was really born out of my frustration of trying to find stuff inside of Eclipse or finding a magical ID that I, that I, that I needed. So, um, you know, it's been quite popular with, with people and, you know, I hope to extend it in the future with uh, uh, some, some new abilities. Another cool thing, a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, the Control Shift T, basically in searching for Java classes. So I decided to come up with something similar in PDE. So uh, basically uh, it's called Open Plugin Artifact. You hit uh, Command, Command Shift A. And now you could search for things like org eclipse and let's say JDT, oop, I misspelled it. And you could quickly jump to various plugins, extension points, uh, you know, extensions, and even packages, exported packages. So you're able to jump within sort of one quick shortcut to various, uh, various uh, places. You can jump to an extension, you, you know, eventually jump to an extension. You'll see, oh, there it is. So it's quite nice, it's, you know, you kind of get used to these shortcuts doing job development, you want to do the same thing with plugins. All right, moving on. Ah, API tooling. 
Uh, this is my last one, I believe. Nope, we get, to, we get to skip target editor. But so API tooling was something new that we came up uh, to uh, in, in Eclipse. Uh, basically, uh, the biggest problem you have when you start developing plugins, you start modularizing your applications, sort of keeping consistent with versions. So for example, in Eclipse, we have this thing. So if we, if we have API in 3.3, right, and we move to 3.4, we have to guarantee that API works. So what you do is when, when you declare API, you have to be careful. Like, you know, maybe changing a method signature is going to break binary compatibility, right? So you have to be very careful when you craft your APIs. And this is always so painful that we dealt, you know, basically every release, at the end of the release, we had, we had the API police, right? And they would go and scan code and try to figure out who broke what, you know, who maybe added a method or removed a method that would break compatibility. So we actually created tooling in the 3.4 to release to do this type of stuff. So I actually have a little example that shows uh, some of the power that you could do with API tooling. So this is a, not the best example, but uh, you'll, get, you'll get an idea of, of what you could do. So I, I have like a sample of little view I created. And uh, I annotated it with uh, something called uh, no extend. It's just a little Java doc thing uh, that API tooling uses. You declare no extend. And uh, you could also do this on method level too. So you could do no override. So if we look at another plugin, I have another plugin there that actually extends this guy. I have sample view too, right? This guy extends sample view. And if you notice, in the problems view, we have uh, some warnings for us. Sample view illegally extend, or sample view two illegally extends sample view. And we also have sample view two illegally overrides this stuff. And this is the type of stuff that API tools allows you to do. And it's actually quite highly uh, configurable, so if you look at the, at, you know, this is where you could, you know, set your, what, what, what considers an API warning or, you know, binary compatibility issue. Uh, you could set, um, you know, all these various things to basically tweak, you know, how you want to do things. It also, ha you know, handles version management. If you could declare API and you forgot that, and you forget to add a since tag. In Eclipse, we like to, you know, you declare API, we'll add since 3.4 or since 3.3. It will catch these issues for you and, like, throw up errors and markers. So this is really cool stuff if you are uh, really worried about, uh, about uh, version management. So I guess in the interest of, of time, I will open things up for, for questions. If, uh... Two quick questions. Yep. So for uh, Q&A, does anyone have questions? I mean, I'm available also offline uh, pretty much until uh, the end of this for, for questions. But uh, any questions before I wrap things up? All that? We'll close it up. So thanks, everyone.